Hello and welcome to part 2 of this ClearML onboarding video series. If you missed part 1, you'll want to check it out in the description below. We'll take the example that we built in part 1 of this video series and execute it on a remote machine first. Then we'll turn it into a pipeline using ClearML pipelines. And finally, we'll add some automations on top just to finish everything off. So without further ado, Let's get started. Starting with remote execution, we'll see how easy it can be to clone an existing experiment from the experiment manager and rerun it on a remote machine while changing the original parameters, all from within the web UI. When the new model is trained, we can compare it to the previous one. In this part of the video, we'll also take a look at the ClearML model repository. Models aren't just attached to their original experiment. They're a standalone entity that is stored inside a queryable repository. You can use tags, model names, and advanced filters and sorting to easily manage all of your models. We'll be using this functionality in part 3, where we will deploy one of the models for training in this video. Next, we'll take a look behind the scenes to see how this remote execution really works, focusing on the workers and queue system that ClearML uses to schedule your tasks. You can run a ClearML agent from anywhere, a local machine, a VM, from any cloud machine, or even from a Google Colab will also give some extra attention to how you can run ClearML workers inside a Kubernetes cluster. All right, running this experiment remotely is re actually rather simple now that we have already used the experiment manager and the data versioning tool of ClearML. Now, first of all, what are we going to run this experiment on? Now, it can be any machine. It can literally be any machine. It can be a remote machine that is local in your own environment. It can be a remote machine on the cloud, it can be a Google Colab. So it doesn't really matter which type of machine you want to run it on. It's a single command to set everything up, but you'll see that later in the video. So I already have what is called a ClearML agent running. So now we have to get this task, this experiment onto that machine. And everything starts actually not in the code, but in the ClearML web UI. So if I go there, this is the experiment manager, remember? So we have our different experiment runs here. And this is actually the one, if you look at our execution tab, this is the one that was actually the data versioned one, right? So inside of this, we have all of the code right here that gets the data from our data set or our version data set of Claremont data. Now we want to run this code on a remote machine. And so it, the easiest way to do this, there are several ways in Claremont, but the easiest way of doing this is actually to just simply right click it and clone the experiment. So I'll keep the name clone of XGBoost simple so we know which one is which. And then suddenly everything becomes into draft mode. And draft mode is actually very interesting because you can change anything. So all of the outputs are gone, obviously, because yeah, the model hasn't run yet or like the experiment hasn't run yet, but all of the execution parameters and the configuration parameters are still there. And the key night on the view will have seen that they're now editable. So because we have the same code that we want to run somewhere else, we can actually just override any of the parameters, right? Because we, we Kernel knows which kind of parameters are where in the code. We use the task.connect function to do just that. So I can, for example, say, hey, I want the, um, the ETA to be 0 0.4, and I want the seed to be something else entirely. Now, if I save this, nothing will happen, obviously, because we haven't actually put it on the remote machine to be executed yet. That's what we can do with right-clicking the task and clicking Enqueue. I'll Enqueue it in the default queue for now, and if I click Enqueue, what will happen is it will, Caramel will add this experiment to a queue for, a, for an, a remote agent to work on. And as you can see, it's now currently running. So the agent was actually listening to that queue and has now picked up this experiment to execute it on its own. If I click on console now, we actually see that output is starting to appear. We see that our environment setup was completed successfully and it has started task execution. We also see the different outputs that we would normally get on our local computer. And so this is actually the remote machine, it's, it's called Beast Zero, that is currently working on the same code. If I go to our code right here, the Caramel agent basically just clones all of this, applies the uncommitted changes, installs all the packages, and then runs the code. 
And the thing that we did is changing the parameters is actually here. It's, this is the magic line for it. We connected all of our parameters to the task. And so if the remote machine with the ClearML agent is actually getting this code, it will say like, hey, okay, I actually get these parameters in Python, but from the task, I received that these and these and these parameters are changed now. We added, the, we edited them inside of the UI. And so now ClearML will basically say, okay, I'll update those parameters in Python runtime, like in the actual memory of the Python interpreter. And so everything starting from that line onwards will work with these new parameters as they are in QML and not as they are uh, defined in Python itself. So this is very, very uh, cool and a very interesting way to deal with a remote execution of parameters. And so the remote execution of experiments, sorry. And so the whole goal of your code should be to parameter parameterize everything. And so as long as all of those parameters are actually possible to be run in code and you can change them, all you have to do is add them to the QML task. And from now on, you can pass that through to quality assurance people of, or other people of your team or yourself, clone as many of those as you want, change some of the parameters or even the data set ID that it was used to train on, and you can go straight ahead with a training remotely. Now, as we can see here, the code is, or like the experiment is, has been completed. Uh, the accuracy is 53.39. All the scalers came in just fine. So this actually ran on a different machine. Now, I want to highlight one more thing uh, of this whole system, and that is the model step. It's the only tab that we haven't seen yet. Inside of the model step, you'll actually see all of the different models that were gathered while we were training our different experiments or different models. All of these are parts from our previous experiments and this one is from our clone. Now the interesting part here is that this is actually our model repository and you're actually building this up as you go along because you're using the QML experiment manager, you're actually building organically building your own model repository that you can then later use to deploy these models to for example QML serving which we'll see at the end of the video. So I just want to highlight the fact that all of the models are in here and downloadable and also it's a queryable list. This is very important because you can, for example, say, hey, I want, uh, let me add a tag here, uh, play mom as the tag. And now I can actually say, I want to only have tags with hey mom or just everything but with the tag hey mom, right? And so this is very, very nice uh, to to have this organized model repository that is completely queryable with tags and everything else, just built in. You don't have to do anything extra. So now we've run our remote experiments. We've seen that actually all of these models are captured inside of the model repository. So now it's time to take a look at what happened behind the scenes just now. How do you set up a ClearML agent? How are these queues working? Let's take a look at that. But before we do that, one more thing that I forgot to mention, if we go back to our models here, if we go to here, you also see the created task. So you always have a link back to the task that created the model. And then if we go to our experiments themselves, let's go here, we have under artifacts, the same link to that model. So if I click on that, a new tab will open and we'll go back to our clone of our model, right? So I just wanted to interject this Let's get back to explaining what's going on behind the scenes and how these ClearML agents actually work. So it all starts with the workers and queues tab in the ClearML web UI. You can go there if you press on this button on the left hand side. It's called workers and queues and you see, you'll see a whole bunch of them here because that's what I've already set up. But that's basically how ClearML's orchestration and scheduling system works. It's using workers and queues. Now we'll start with the queues because they're the easiest ones. And it's basically what, exactly what it sounds like. It's just a queue in which you can enqueue or put in different experiments that will be executed one after the other. So you can see that I have a whole bunch of queues here already. And the ones that we used before is called default. We can just create a new queue right now and call it full overview. There we go. 
it's the video that we're making currently. And right here you can see full overview. Then we have a bunch of workers. So as you can see here, we have in the default queue, one worker, let's see here, one worker that is currently running the load or that is currently listening to that default queue. And then in our full overview queue, we have no workers yet. And we also have no experiments yet. So that's what we did before while with and queuing everything. So now let's take a look at how to set up this worker so that it can actually listen to this queue. It's only those two things that you need. Right, so here are our workers, uh, but we have our beast zero. That's the one that is listening, if we click here, on the default queue. But it's actually not meant to be listening or like not uh, instantiated to be listening on the full overview queue. We've just created it. So we'll have to spin up a new agent in order to do that. A worker is also called an agent or a KML agent. Now I have a bunch of others here, but we'll see that in just a minute. Now I go to this uh, new notebook here. And actually, if you go to the ClearML uh, documentation or the GitHub repository, you'll find these notebooks. They're just uh, the, the getting started notebooks. And they'll explain to you how to do certain things. One of them is setting up a ClearML agent. Now, I've already run, the setup is very, very simple. It's just installing ClearML and logging in. It's uh, also installing ClearML agent, and then it's just starting the agent. So I already install everything. For now, ClearML agent daemon q foreground. Foreground is not necessary. It's basically just outputting everything that the task is creating in terms of console logs. Um, and then the queue, of course, is the most important one. So we want the ClearML agent to start up a daemon and listen to the queue full overview. Now, this is a Google Colab. It's, it can be any machine. It can be a Kubernetes machine. It can be local. It can be a cloud VM. It can be basically everything you want. If you want to use in the Raspberry Pi cluster in the corner of your room, you definitely can. Um, so the only thing you'll have to do is run this command on that worker. In this case, we'll do that in the Google Colab instance. And that's really cool because it allows us to freely use some GPU power that we might have not had access to before. So thanks to the free GPUs of Google Colab, we can now do this uh, and set it up as a ClearML worker. As you can see, it's currently listening to the full overview queue. Uh, there is no tasks in that queue because we haven't enqueued anything yet. And if we go back to our monitor here, we see that our GPU all uh, Colab worker is currently online. We see that it's listening to the full overview queue. And if we go to our queues, we see that in a full overview, we have now one worker, which is the Colab notebook or the Colab instance. All right, now it's time to add some things to this um, queue, right? So we have our projects here. Let me go to full overview again. We have here our earlier clone that we already run in the default queue. Now I can, for example, say I want only to, queue to clone this one. And I'll clone it several times just so we have some preliminary load that we can put in the inside of the queue, right? Now I want to select all of these. I can change the parameters. I'm not going to do it in, in this case, but remember I can change the parameters and then I can enqueue them for either right click or right here in the bottom, I can click on enqueue. Now currently uh, I don't want them into the default queue. I want them into the full overview queue right here. Enqueue them and they should all be pending. Now the um, Google Colab machine is going to pick up one of these uh, tasks and start creating the virtual environment for them. So I'll, I'll just leave that be, uh, but currently we want to be looking at the workers and queue step because I want to show you one more thing that this system can do. And that is inside of the queues and their full overview, you'll see that the next experiment is currently set to one of the clones here. I can actually change the priority as well. So I can, for example, say, hey, this third clone, I want it to be the next task in line. I can also say, hey, this is the next, exp oh, sorry, I can also say uh, under workers, it's currently working on this experiment. If I click on that experiment, I go to the experiment view and I can right click and abort it. This means that I can basically say, tell to the Google Colab instance, hey, stop this task, just control C it, and it will automatically start on the next one. So you'll see here in the console logs that the process is aborted by the user while it was still installing some packages. 
Now you also see this in the Google Code App instance and this works anywhere. So this is a very, very dynamic and easy way to deal with your remote load in your remote machines. Right, I've now shown you how you can set up uh, very easily a single machine. Uh, let me scroll all the way up here, just using QML agent daemon q There are other ways to run loads though, so let's take a look. If I go back here in the UI to applications, I can see that we have a bunch of autoscalers here. And this is actually the second way you can run QML agents um, without using just the, the single uh, command is an autoscaler. And an autoscaler is very interesting. What it does is it spins up, it listens to a specific queue. It's just a service that only listens to the queue and it actually doesn't have machines yet but it's connected to cloud where it can actually instantiate those machines if it needs to. So what we can do is have one of the all scalers, scalers listen to one of the queues or multiple of the queues. And then whenever a task or a experiment gets enqueued in that queue that it's listening to, it will actually spin up a virtual machine, set up ClearML, connect it to your server, and set up a PRML agent as well to listen to that queue. That agent will pull the task from the queue and then it will execute it, stream everything live back to the experiment manager like we saw before, and then it will spin it back down again as well. So you don't actually pay for more GPU than you actually use. So you can do this on AWS, GCP, or we have our own ClearML GPU compute as well. If I uh, launch a new one here, you'll see how it works. You can basically choose your GPU type in AWS and GCP. You can choose your machine type. Uh, let's set it to 3090 in number of GPUs. I can set uh, the monitored queue to be full overview. And if I launch this now, the ClearML compute autoscaler will start listening to the full overview queue. So that's how an autoscaler works. It's all built in into ClearML. Um, the ClearML compute is all built in into the app itself. So you pay through the app, as you can see here. These numbers might change, of course, in the future. If it's AWS or GCP, you just bring your little compute, right? It's just you have to set up um, your auth, your, your um, credentials, and then ClearML will take it from there. Then there is the final way to run everything. I already mentioned you can run the ClearML agent on Kubernetes but there is actually some extra stuff that comes into, into play there to make it easier to work with. So this is the uh, GitHub page for the ClearML agent. And if I scroll down here, you see that we have Kubernetes integration right here. And I think the easiest way personally to run, to run the ClearML agent as part of Kubernetes is to use the ClearML Kubernetes GNU. Basically, you run the GNU itself on a CPU node and then the glue itself will pull jobs from the ClearML queues, right? Just like we just did in the full overview queue, it will pull those queues and it will prepare a Kubernetes job based on a template, a YAML template that you define. And then that allows Kubernetes to basically set up a pod in which the ClearML agent will install the job environment, install all the packages, and then actually run the, um, the experiments which will also again live translate back to the to the ui or to the server so that has a lot of benefits it's super super easy and very much the same way you can run caramel on slurm as well so it will basically just pull uh, a task from the caramel queue and then put it into a slurm job for you so those are all possible options, there's basically no way that you can't find a way to get your ClearML agent running and then integrate it into the ClearML ecosystem as part of a worker that is listening to a queue. Right, so now that you know how we remotely executed all of our tasks here, let's take a look at how we can take this to the next level using pipelines. We're going to take the training script we used before and turn it into a ClearML pipeline. You can build ClearML pipelines by chaining together existing tasks with a pipeline controller script. But then the video will focus on a second way, Python decorators. Using the ClearML Python decorators, we can turn normal Python functions into full-blown pipelines. Each step in the pipeline will become its own ClearML task and will be executed on a remote machine, if possible, in parallel. There are rich options to define the environment of each step separately, such as which GitHub repository or base Docker container to use. 
Finally, we'll explore the Pipelines tab in the ClearML web UI to see how it's visualized. Now, Pipelines are this really cool combination of different ClearML components. One of those components is the fact that yeah, every step of this pipeline will actually become a ClearML task, which is wholly equivalent to a ClearML experiment. So every step of the way will be its separate experiments and tracked in the experiment manager. And then second, we're going to run each of these each of these different steps on possibly different machines. So we're essentially going to enqueue them all in the queuing system that we saw just now, and then let some workers work on them in a distributed way. So you could conceivably have a pipeline with hundreds of steps and then hundreds of workers working on those pipeline steps, either in parallel or in series, depending on how you want to set up your pipeline. Right, so let's jump over to the code here and let me show you how that's done. Now, this is our XGBoost training script that we saw before, and we essentially want to turn it into a pipeline using ClearML's Python uh, pi pipeline decorators. Now, I want to tr uh, create three distinct steps. So one is I want to create this first part into a pre data preparation step. Then two, I want a model training step in which we train the actual XGBoost model. And then three, I want a evaluation step as well that will actually gather the predictions and get me the accuracy back. If I go to the script, I've, you see that I've actually prepared this. So first off, we have our prepared data. This is all of the same code as we saw before. And then we have our train model here, which is exactly the same code. And we have our evaluate model right here, which is exactly the same code. Now there's definitely a few things that have changed. Let me start with the first. We have a new function called run pipeline. And this run pipeline is essentially your script or your function that chains together the different pieces of the pipeline. Based on this execution flow within this function, ClearML will determine the, the format of your pipeline. So what we'll do here is first we'll prepare the data and get these variables. Then we'll use these variables inside the train model. And then we'll uh, use evaluate model to get the accuracy based on the train model and the X test and Y test. Then we'll report the accuracy to the um, pipeline itself, and then we'll print it as well. And now this is where ClearML comes in, is this accuracy. ClearML will, thanks to the decorator that I'll explain in just a second, ClearML will detect that this accuracy is actually dependent on this pipeline step, this function. And so it will actually block this execution until this is completed. Right. So based on this function, we're going to set up our DAG, our pipeline. Now, the first thing we have to do is then set this as the pipeline itself, right? Using the pipeline decorator, we can set this as the pipeline. We can give it a name, in this case, a simple pipeline, a project, full overview, and the version of the pipeline to use. Now, this is very, very simple. And then we actually run it right here. Now you can use Pipeline Decorator locally. It's a lot faster because you just use your local environment. But obviously if you want to train uh, or like run this pipeline remotely or on a different machine or distribute it, you don't actually uh, do this. So you just run the pipeline here. And then every step of the pipeline will be added to the queues for the workers to handle off. Now, what does, what does these, what do these functions look like? We have the prepare data, and that's actually a component in our pipeline. We define return values, and then we can also cache it. Now, this is very interesting because every step in the pipeline of ClearML can be cached. So if, you, if it receives the same inputs, it will just use the uh, exact same outputs that it saw before. So as long as your function is not stochastic, and it's deterministic, you can actually use the caching to get a lot faster results. So usually, for example, in this case, preparing the data, if the data set name is the same, I want it to be cached. Now, this is actually not ideal because we actually are getting the data set based on its name, and that will take the latest. So as long the name can stay the same, but the data set that is returned in this line can vary. So we actually want to remove this caching because what we want is that every time we run the pipeline with the same name, it might, if we wanted to look at our PRML data set and see if it's still the same. And if, this, if the data set has been updated with the same name, it should take that one instead. 
it does that automatically, but you can't use um, caching in that case. Right, so we define this as a component and we can set a task type. You can do this in the experiment manager as well. You can set a task type to data processing. This is just to make it easy to visualize what kind of task this is. And you can also use it to sort or filter within the web UI. Then another thing you'll see is that we're importing inside of this function. So all of the imports that are needed in this function have to be inside of the function itself. And this is actually very important because, like I said before, this function will become its own code base. This will become a ClearML task just like an experiment is. And so it needs all of the code that it needs to operate right inside of this function. However, you can also add to this component uh, decorator which type of Docker container you want that specific uh, component to run in, and you can specify a GitHub repository. So if you want that function or the code in that function to run within the environment of a specific GitHub repository, and you want every single function or every single step of the pipeline to run in a different GitHub repository, totally possible. So you can do that from right within here. Check the documentation if you want more info on that. Right, we do the very same thing here. So we import XGBoost and we import our task here for to train the model. Uh, we also always have to set the return values. So in this case, I'm going to return the model itself. And I want that as a return value so Clarabel knows that it should keep track of that value and then also send it to the next part in the pipeline. Also, I've set this task type to training and I'm going to do the same thing here. So I want to return value of my evaluate model to be accuracy. This time I can cache it because this is completely uh, deterministic. And then also set the task types uh, as QC or quality control. Now, if I run this, this pipeline is going to run, oh, but there was something still running here. Uh, this pipeline is going to run completely locally. So. This is just as an, as an idea for this video, but ideally you would not run this locally and then every step would become its own um, task and will be added to the queue as well. Right, so you can see that a new task has been created and if we jump over, because this will take up just a little time, if we jump over to our web UI here, the pipelines panel is uh, the next interesting part. So it's right here on the left under pipelines. And what you'll see here is that we now have a new pipeline called Simple Pipeline, the one that we just created. You'll also see that we have our different steps here uh, that are yet to be arranged. So ClearML already knows that these are going to be the different components of the pipeline, but not until it has completely run, will it be able to figure out their position towards each other. You have some uh, info right here. So every pipeline has a ID just like any task or any experiment uh, or any data set for that matter. You also have parameters. So as you can see in the uh, code here, you, we have a run pipeline data set name fashion amnest. And because data set name is an argument within the pipeline decorator, it actually pops up right here under the parameters of the whole pipeline. And this will come in handy later because Remember that we can clone any of the experiments that we've already done and then rerun them using different arguments by editing them in draft mode, right? You can do the same thing but with a full pipeline. So in this case, you'll see that if I click on new run, you can actually change the dataset name because it's a parameter on the pipeline. So you can, you can mix and match however you want that. Uh, that's really, really cool. So as you can see, we now have our prepared data done. Uh, if we click on that, we actually get the uh, some information on the specific uh, inputs and outputs, for example, the exact um, ID that was used for the data set, and then some arguments information as well. You can click on details here to get some of the uh, logs of the actual pipeline, click on a specific block or a specific step in the pipeline, and you can both see the console as well as the standalone code that the, this code became. So now you see we have our prepared data here, as well as a whole bunch of code that Clearmel added to make it work as a pipeline step. All right, and then a final thing I want to show you is if you click on the step in the pipeline, you can actually click on full details right here. Uh, we just see uh, that the pipeline has completed, or like not completed just yet, but has arranged itself because it's currently working on the evaluate model. So that's all good. 
If I click on full details here, you'll see that it actually is just a task like any other. We're currently in the projects tab. We have our execution information. We have uncommitted changes, installed packages, container information. We have our uh, configuration right here. We have any artifacts, info console logs, scalers and plots, and debug samples, as many of them as you want. So because this is the first part, we only get the sample image uh, because that's the only thing that was logged in that first part of the training data over in the training experiment. All right, so if I go back to my pipeline, it should now be completed. There it is. So this is completely completed. We have our data set name right here as a parameter, and we can also have outputs on the pipeline level. So in this case, I am logged the accuracy as a metric on the pipeline itself. So hope you found this interesting in terms of pipelines. This is like a combination of a lot of different components within QML. And now we can go one step further in automating all of this stuff. So let's take a look at schedulers and trayers. One last thing though, if I go back to my code here, you'll see we use the pipeline decorator. You don't have to use it this way. This way you can easily use the pipeline decorator to create pipelines from Python functions. You can also create pipelines from tasks. So if you already have tasks from, for example, different teams, you can chain together tasks using a pipeline decorator script. So that was just an addition. Let's take a look at schedulers and triggers. Both schedulers and triggers are only a part of QRML's automation module, but they are the most important. Every event in QRML, such as a failed task or a newly created dataset, can be used to trigger a next event, such as a pipeline starting. In the following part of the video, we'll set up a trigger scheduler to launch the pipeline we just created whenever a new version of the dataset is created. The task scheduler does a very similar thing, only instead of an event, it is triggered by a schedule, such as 9 a.m. every day. Finally, QRML has some powerful GitHub CI CD actions that you can use out of the box, or you can use them as an inspiration for your own automations. Right, so the scheduler and the trigger are two types of automation components within the QRML ecosystem. And let me show you what, the, what those look like. Within our trigger scheduler script right here, you can actually see that it's very, very simple to set one up. And we'll start with the trigger scheduler. So the trigger scheduler is basically saying that you can schedule or start any task or let's say pipeline based on any other event within the QRML ecosystem. So in this case, I'm using a dataset trigger, which says if a dataset is newly created or comes in with these requirements, then I want to schedule a specific task. For example, this one. And a task scheduler does something very, very similar, only in, instead of using a trigger as its trigger, it uses a schedule as its trigger. So you could say, retrain your pipeline every day or every week, right? So based on, given that that is the only difference between the two, I'm going to be focusing on the trigger scheduler here. Now, what I want to do here is set up a trigger scheduler, set the pooling frequency to one minute, basically check every minute for incoming changes and events, and then add a dataset trigger. I'll give it the name retrain of dataset and schedule a single task ID. Now, for those keen eyed under you, you will recognize this task ID because it is the task ID of our pipeline that we just made, right? So what I want to be doing here is whenever a new dataset called Fashion Amnest comes in, I want to reschedule a pipeline that will take that fashion, new data fashion amnest and actually retrain and evaluate the model all over again. So if I go back here, I want to get this pipeline and then schedule it inside of the default queue. So obviously this time we can't run it locally um, because yeah, it's going to be scheduled from any time. So as, as uh, you, what you can do though, is put up your caramel agent locally and then everything will run locally, but it won't run in this Python process. Now we have our trigger project as well, which is full overview naturally. And we have our trigger name, which is a fashion amnest. So given that we're doing a data set trigger, the trigger name is actually the data set name. There's multiple different options. Um, you can add like a task trigger, you can add a pipeline trigger. There's like a whole bunch of triggers that you can use. I'm going to focus on the data set trigger, but imagine you get an email whenever a task fails, for example, that's definitely something that you can make here. 
And then I want to start the trigger remotely. Again, you can run this locally just to debug, but this time we're going to run it remotely and have it run on one of our agents. So if I click on uh, run here, what will happen is ClearMail will detect that this is a trigger. It will uh, mention or it will get this start remotely, put this in the queue. And then once the start remotely is uh, triggered, it will essentially say, hey, I've reached the end of my valuable life here. I will stop the Python process, but right now there is something in your queue that is waiting to be executed. So if you can see here, switching to remote execution, output log page right there. If I click that open, we'll go to our app.clearlml, and you can see that we're starting to task execution right here. So currently, uh, if we go into info, we can see that we're currently in the services queue and we're on, so we're actually scheduled on a worker, right? So beast zero is listening to the services queue, which means that beast zero, the worker, the agent is currently waiting, running indefinitely and listening to this um, trigger in order to, to actually fire, right? Now this will run indefinitely. So that's why the services queue is usually used for these kind of indefinitely running tasks. And you can schedule a lot of CPU, very low powered agents to listen to that queue so that you can always uh, have that kind of workload done. Now what we need to do is actually create a new version of our data set and then we'll trigger our uh, trigger scheduler. So let me go back here. We remember how to do that. We have our fashion MNIST in which we already changed Hey Mom. So I want to create a new file and let's see if this works, and it should. And then we do clear about create, or oh, clear about data, sorry, create. Let's put the, the full project or the project, the full overview with the fashion MNIST name. And then for the parent, I will actually go to my data sets here under fashion MNIST and get the ID of my latest data set so that I'm sure that it's based on this one. This will actually create a third one right above there. So let me add that. And once that data set is created, we can add our new little file and it should automatically trigger our trigger scheduler. Okay, so let's wait a second and see uh, when it brings us. All right, the data set is created. So now let's use QML data file and, sorry, files fashion MNIST and then clear ML data close. That will finalize our data set, upload the file and hopefully trigger the pipeline. All right, our data set is closed and finalized. So hopefully if we go to our project here, we'll see that here is our fashion MNIST data set. And if we go to our pipelines, there is one pipeline currently pending. So it is triggered and it has the tag retrain on data set and currently it's running and it went from pending to running because there's other agents running on this queue as well that are listening to this pipeline. Uh, this pipeline is simply a clone of the previous one, but because we used the name Fashion MNIST as the data set and because we just updated Fashion MNIST, the code inside of the pipeline, let me show you, will actually grab the latest version of that data set. So this data set.get right here will get a local copy of the latest version of the data set with that name. In our case, that will just have been updated. And so as we can see, it's currently running. So this is just an example of the many automations you can do within QML given that you have access to the tasks, to the events, to the pipelines, to the data sets, everything is inside that ecosystem. Right, so now that we have a fully retraining pipeline that we can automatically trigger either every day, every week, every month, or based on a trigger of, for example, an incoming data set, why not take it one step further still and use ClearML survey to actually serve the model as an API? In continuing with my tradition of forgetting one point before moving to the next, I also want to show you that we have three GitHub CICD out of the box components as well. So this, these three actually extend the automation capabilities of ClearML next to the schedulers that we just saw. And you can just drag and drop them into your existing GitHub CICD pipelines. Now, these three combined with the examples that I gave you should also give you the tools to build basically any automation that you want to. So tune in to part three of this video series if you want to know more about how serving works within the QML ecosystem. 
If you can't wait, however, to get your hands on the remote execution capabilities, pipelines, or other automations within QML, head over to app.clear.ml and get your free hosted server right now. You can also check out our Slack channel if you need any help.